Welcome. Thank you all for coming. My name is Alexa Gilmore. I practice acupuncture and Chinese medicine in South Portland. Um, today, you all are here because we're going to talk about worry, which from a Chinese medicine perspective is the emotional spleen. So we're going to talk about the spleen energetic in Chinese medicine, how that fits in with your digestion quite a bit, and then how it fits in with this idea of worry and worry as an emotion. Have any of you been to hear me talk here before? I feel like I want to be on this side. Can I move over here? Um, so what I like to do is I'll give you a little intro. I'm going to run through a little bit of um, Chinese medicine theory and the thinking behind this, just so you have a bit of a framework to work from. Any experience with acupuncture, Chinese medicine, Tai Chi? Yeah, quite a bit. Like receiving or receiving. giving, receiving? OK. And you enjoy it, hopefully? Yeah. It's been good? Yeah. OK. Others have any baseline familiarity with Chinese medicine? A little bit? Anyone like totally brand new? Not so much? OK, so that's good. So the theme is basically going to be that there is a distinct and very strong connection between worry and your digestion. We have to digest the information that comes through us in our lives the same way that we have to digest food. So taking it in, processing it, breaking it down into its parts, assimilating it, and then getting rid of what we don't need. We have to do that with the information that comes at us, the same way that we have to do that with the food that we eat. So it's a new way of thinking about um, taking in information from our environment. And as this picture depicts, for the most part in our culture, we're overwhelmed with information. We're having to process a lot of things mentally more than we ever have before. And that's really doing a number, welcome, on our spleen energetic, which we'll talk about more, our ability to digest our food and our ability, our ability to digest our lives and our thoughts and our emotions well. Um, so it's a two-way street. I want you to get familiar with the idea that our quality, the quality of our thoughts is going to impact the quality of our digestion. And likewise, the quality of our, of our digestion can impact the quality of our thoughts. Um, it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg. We don't always know which one comes first. When I'm working with patients, sometimes we tease that out and it becomes clear. But it's a communication that's happening all the time that one is affecting the other. Somebody might have a constitutional deficiency in their ability to digest food well, and that might lead to certain thought patterns that have been with them their whole life. As we ramp up their digestion and make it stronger, those thought patterns can improve. Similarly, if people get stuck in patterns of thought, because of stressful situations, because of stressful relationships, maybe they've been a student forever. Um, overthinking, constantly ruminating over time can ultimately go inside and impact your digestion. And now you're stuck in this battle where they're just feeding off of each other. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, our lifestyle is a detriment to both. We have information overload. There's a bunch of statistics about this. but. Um, we are exposed to the equivalent of 174 newspapers of data a day. Um, the amount of information I've heard that we are, we're exposed to today is more than most people a couple hundred years ago were exposed to in a lifetime of just facts and figures. And this is not wisdom, it's, right? It's one thing if this were making us more wise, but it's just stuff that we have to process and digest, and it's overwhelming our systems all the time. And then, of course, we're inundated with food for the most part. We don't live, we have lots of people who are. Um, calorie rich but nutrition deficient. We have this overabundance of food, most of us, that's not really giving us good, um, it's not really wise food, right? It's sort of this information that comes in but it's not serving us well. And then we're doing a lot of this at the same time. So we're sitting at our computer while we're eating, we're on the phone while we're eating, we're driving while we're eating. So if you think about it being a two-way street, we cannot do both of these things well at the same time. So when you're at your computer, and I'm guilty of this too on busy days, but when you're at your computer and you're eating at your computer, um, you're not digesting your food well and you're not processing that information well. When people come to me for digestive issues, uh, we had this conversation, I tell them, don't take my word for it, just try for a month. What would it be like if you always sat down and mindfully ate your food and didn't try to think and digest at the same time? Give it a month, see what happens, and I guarantee you're going to feel differently. And when you go back to trying to eat while you work, you'll see that it's not actually working for you. It's not successful. Um, this is sort of a, a, a general thinking about Chinese medicine that I want to share um, in terms of how to understand how we're working. People think that it's kind of magic, probably not y'all because you're here and so you have an interest in it, but people think that it's magic, that it's hippy-dippy, it's kind of wackadoo, or, and I'll put needles in and people will think, that they really will call me a magician, like it's amazing that I feel better. And it's actually not. 
It's actually a science. It's been developed over millennia by people who were paying close attention and observing the body and how we can put points in certain places and affect change in the system. So I encourage you to think about it the way that we do Western medicine, which is that there are certain conditions for which blood work can tell us a lot of information, right? We get information about your hormones, about your um, levels of specific nutrients in your body. An x-ray gives us a really good picture of your bones. We don't discount the value of an x-ray because it doesn't give us the soft tissue information that an MRI does, right? We don't discount an MRI because it's not telling us about the electricity running through your heart the way that an EKG does. There are all these different lenses we can put on to give us information that's relevant, figure out how to best treat you and match um, the information that we get to tools that are going to help you feel better. So I encourage you to think about Chinese medicine as another version of that. We have a different kind of lens that we can put on to make sense of your symptoms, to make sense of um, your suffering. And then through that lens, we have all of these tools that we can use to help make you feel better. It's not always uh, a better lens to look through than an x-ray or an MRI, but it has something different to offer um, and is no better or worse than an x-ray or MRI depending on what you're dealing with. And so then in the context of Chinese medicine, there's all these different ways that I might be looking at the body. We're going to be talking a lot today about five-phase theory or five-element theory because that's where this, this split, the connection between digestion and spleen and worry, which is why we're here, all come together. But there's the yin-yang theory, there's zong-fu theory, there's channel theory, all related, all share a language, but all give me, as someone who specializes in Chinese medicine, a little bit of a different way of understanding what's going on with someone, similar to all the ways that we um, can access understanding in Western medicine. So the basics, maybe, some of, maybe all of you are familiar with this, but foundationally we talk about this idea of qi, and that qi is a thing, it travels through our channel system, provides nourishment for every cell, tissue, muscle, gland, organ, provides vitality for the body. It doesn't mean that, you're, you know, that um, your circulation doesn't do that, or your nervous system doesn't do that, or your lymphatic system doesn't do that. It's something that includes all of those, but is also somewhat separate. It has a, um, it can be more specific than all those things and also broader, but it, it, it infiltrates our whole system and gives us vitality. When she becomes blocked, pain and disease result. That's the simple premise. It gets a lot more complicated than that, but that's the simple premise. Um, and you can imagine it like water flows through rivers on the earth. We've got qi flowing through our channels in our body. And so on the earth, a happy, healthy ecosystem is going to have more water in one place and less water in another place. That's true in our bodies as well. Maybe these look familiar to you, pictures of channels on some little statuettes. More pictures, so I don't, can't tell, probably don't come out very well, but um, they run you know, down the front and the back of the body, down the arms and the legs. And the channels, if you're familiar with these images and the points on them where we actually put the needles, those are the superficial pathways of these channels. They all dive deep and they really create a web within our whole system. The superficial channels and the acupuncture points are places where as an acupuncturist, I can needle and affect change on the system as a whole because they do dive deep and communicate internally as well. Uh, channels are a two-way street. So uh, in a couple ways, they act as mediators between the external environment and our internal environment. They have to, the external world kind of moves through us and internally, or can. Um, they also relay information from just the exterior of our body itself to the interior of our body itself. So if you've got something wrong with an internal organ, it's a two-way street. If there's something wrong with an internal organ, it can show up in your channels. There's lots of ways that I'm making sense of somebody's symptoms to figure out what's going on internally. But it can show up in your channels. So an example of that, um, there are certain styles of acupuncture that do a lot of actual palpation of the channels. And we know that along the lung channel, which runs up your forearm this way, um, around about here, people who have a long history of lung problems, maybe uh, lots of pneumonia or bronchitis as a kid, maybe lots and lots of grief in their life, which is the emotion associated with the lung that hasn't been processed well. But things either physically or emotionally related to the lung can develop nodules in the channel. So when people come in for complaints that may not seem specifically lung related, we can find a nodule there and as a clinician go, hmm, I wonder if there's something in that lung energetic that would help this person feel better. Similarly, or oppositely, relatedly, uh, trauma or dysfunction at the surface of the body can ultimately impact the internal organs via the channels. So an example of that, this is an example from a great book that I use for sports medicine. 
um, a physician in New York who was treating a, Chinese medicine wise, treating a patient for heel pain, and the bladder channel and the kidney, the kidney runs on the inside of the ankle, the bladder runs on the outside. So her heel, her, cal her calcaneus was out, and he was trying to get that back into place. As he did so, and her heel pain went away, she came back in and reported, yeah, and I've had this really funky bladder problem, I don't know what it was, incontinence and, you know, getting up at night much more urgently than she had been accustomed to, and it, you know, from, from her perspective, it spontaneously resolved. But that's an example of the bladder channel was out because her heel was out. But as we got that, the integrity of that channel back into alignment, it created alignment in her internal system. And that's what makes this medicine really fun. Um, another way to think about it, um, it's like traffic management. So none of these are good. This is an excess. So we talk a lot in Chinese medicine about excess, too much of something, or deficiency, and wanting there to be the right healthy amount in every given place. So obviously, all of these are excess. We've got traffic jams. But we also don't want this. We don't want a deserted street either. This would be a deficiency. There's not enough there. So how can I, as an acupuncturist, help guide things so that we've got a bustling street that's full of commerce and culture and people enjoying life in the day um, and not have the traffic jam and not have the empty street? Now, that being said, an empty street like this that's deserted, this maybe is normal in the middle of the night. So it's, it's all about context. And you, if you think about that in terms of the physiology of the body, there are areas where it's OK if there's not that much going on, depending on the situation. But during the day, on like a Saturday, that's not a happy street. Same thing with water. So if you think of traffic as movement of energy, and then um, flooding or drought as a movement of water, we need water. We need it to stay where it belongs, in streams and lakes and ponds and reservoirs. We can create canals and things for it to help move it around. Um, but there's too much water in both of these places, obviously. And there's too little in these. So with the needles and with herbs, we can help direct things where they need to go. So we have a healthy dryness where it needs to be dry and a healthy wetness where it needs to be wet. Um, so why are we talking about the spleen? Mentioned this at the beginning. And digestion, when you're here for worry, it's because they're all part of the same energetic. And we don't think of worry, as someone who practices Chinese medicine, I don't think of worry outside of the context of the spleen. So this is one of the theories I mentioned, five element theory. Fire, earth, metal, water, wood, all interact in the body in many ways. They generate one another. So you can think about wood generating fire. That You can see how that makes sense. You have to burn wood to make fire. Fire generates earth, also makes sense. We burn something down, it becomes char and goes back into the ground. Um, Water generating wood, you need water to help things grow. So they generate each other. They also keep each other in check. We know that fire and water keep each other in check. Just we know that naturally, right? We need water to put it out. Wood and metal keep each other in check. Think about a metal axe and how you need something like an axe to actually you know, cut down a tree or something like that. So they have all these relationships in terms of generation, but also keeping each other in check in the system. And you can't read this slide at all, but we'll go into the important part in more detail. With each one, so this is the same as the last slide, fire, earth, metal, water, wood. And it breaks down so you can see some of the arrows, lots of arrows depicting all the different relationships. And underneath is a list of all of their correspondences. The one that we care about is earth. Um, because earth is the element that corresponds to the spleen and to digestion. And if you look all the way down at the bottom of the list, to worry. Um, so because it might be interesting, the internal organs of Earth are the spleen and the stomach. So some people often have a question, you talk a lot about spleen and digestion in Western medicine, spleen and digestion, why aren't you talking about stomach? Spleen isn't really a digestive organ. True. Um, spleen and stomach work together almost inseparably in Chinese medicine to govern your digestion. We tend to name it spleen because it is more of the kind of overarching energetic of the system where the stomach is more just the place where your food, we call it rots, rots and ripens, your food just kind of goes through your stomach. It doesn't actually have quite the same breadth of actions on the body as a spleen does, so we tend to refer to the spleen. Um, the spleen also in Chinese medicine works with the blood in a way that might be more familiar if you come from a Western background, and we won't go into that for the purposes of this talk, but the spleen does control the blood in lots of ways and work with the blood in lots of ways. Sense organs are the mouth. That makes sense because we eat with our mouth. The tissue is the muscle. So if you think about somebody kind of you know, wasting away or being larger, that often has a lot to do with food, ability to eat or not eat. Um, 
The taste is sweet. Classically speaking, when we're talking about herbal formulations and people would be recovering from a really long illness um, or childbirth maybe or coming back from war and being totally depleted, the kind of formulas we'd give them to just fatten them up really had lots of sweet flavors in them. We know in our culture we're inundated with sweet. We have too many sweets and so it doesn't make quite as much sense in the modern day, but this idea of sweet being really important to kind of build tissue and build mass when people were truly depleted. Um, the season is late summer. That becomes relevant because we'll talk about digestion as um, a moment of transition. So the spleen is a lot about moments of transition of thinking and ruminating but not having it turn to worry. Thinking and ruminating and digesting on things so that it can transform into whatever, give birth to the next phase of things. So uh, earth, is this in-between uh, in between element at these points of transition. And then the emotion is worry. And I can talk more on some of those if it's interesting to you. So what is spleen? These are some of the ways that, that um, we talk about spleen in the context of the medicine. So it rules transformation and transportation. What does that mean, translation? It's the primary organ of digestion. We talked about that. A healthy spleen, Good vitality, someone's just, they've got bright eyes, they've, they've got strong in their body, and they've got good, strong digestion. No complaints, no gas, bloating, nausea, they've got a good appetite, their bowels move. They just have a good, strong constitution. An unhealthy spleen, these people might have, they might tend to um, abdominal distension or pain, like they eat food and they bloat out really fast. They may tend to have loose stools. They may have appetite disorders. Most often they don't have an appetite or they feel nauseous. Um, the spleen stores the consciousness of potentials. What the heck does that mean? So every organ has an emotional or spiritual component to it. So this is where the worry comes in. The translation being, spleen is responsible for the consideration of options, for pondering possibilities, and for making final decisions. So I really like to think about that in terms of digestion. What are we doing when we take food in, but our body is physically sorting things out. What of this is useful for me? What of this do I need to get rid of? And that's... Um, that's, that's related to the spleen and the mind as well in our thinking. So somebody, the thought patterns of somebody with a healthy spleen, they have clear thoughts. Decisions are relatively easy to make. There are other, um, other organs that play into this as well, but um, for the most part, their thoughts, ease in decisions, they have good insights, they want to support other people in situations, they're sort of happy to be really helpful and to nourish others. They're a nurturer. An archetype would be Earth Mother, just sort of like the mother who gathers everybody in. Question? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but um, if you don't have a spleen, would that be considered unhealthy spleen? That's a good question, and I need to read up. I was just reading a conversation recently on that. Um, not necessarily. So obviously, there's not the spleen there doing the physical functions, but there is a sense that that energetic can be there without the physical organ, and certainly the channels are still there. So I don't know how to answer that. I think it's a great question. And now I have to go and figure it out. If you email me, I'll like do some research and get back to you and see what people think about. Yeah. Because um, your channels exist. And I think that there's ways to, um, if we're talking archetypes, to think about this. I mean, it is the actual physical spleen. That matters. There are the actual spleen channels. That matters. But there's also this sense of what the spleen means in the body just as a human in the world. And so ways to, if you feel like any of this speaks to you, and we'll get more to like the earth archetype later, there's ways to cultivate that energy, I think, even in the absence of the organ itself, if it seems like that's out of balance. It's a great question, though. <laughs> uh, and then an unhealthy spleen. So these people worry easily, have difficulty making decisions. So that's the ruminating of worry, is just the going and going and going, and you're just so stuck, you can't just move on and make a, make a decision. Mentally unclear and confused, excessively helpful. So not helping out of the goodness of your heart from your clear, boundaried, healthy space. I want to help you and that's all that there is. But people who are almost helping out of a sense of needing to help because they, they need the attention, they need the feedback, they need the accolades. So there's an, I think we all are familiar with those kinds of people that ha there's a neediness to it. 
where it feels sticky and cloying, like eating something that's too sweet. So you see how all these things kind of circle back around on each other? Sweetness is a delicious flavor, but we've all had desserts where you're just, it's too much. Um, so that, that helpfulness in the same kind of a way. So far so good? Interesting, hopefully? Okay. Um, so worry is transformed by the consciousness of potentials into creativity and faithful support. So the idea is that worry in its virtuous state is actually um, the basis for envisioning new possibilities because it's that taking everything in, churning it up, and spitting out something new. If we don't have that virtue to come in and match with worry, if it's, a, if it's an unhealthy, unbalanced system, then it's just worry and it becomes excessive pondering and you're distressed and, and then it's a problem. So a, a clinical study, this is from a great book, it's called The Web That Has No Weaver. It's t supposedly technically an introduction to Chinese medicine for the layperson. It's really um, dense for the layperson, but it's a, if you're interested, it might be a good read. I still get interesting clinical, I don't know what that is. I'll probably press something on here. And now we have a pointer. Oh wait, that's because I pressed pointer, that's fun. Does it move around? No, okay. Um, so clinical sketch, nobody ever comes in this obvious or my job would be really easy, but you get the idea. So somebody comes in, he's got chronic digestive problems, um, it's textbook, he's got loose stools, he's got abdominal distension, he can't control his appetite, so he suffers from cravings a lot, and that's rampant in our culture, sweet sugar addiction, sweet cravings. Um, he's slightly overweight, he's unable to care for himself outside the realm of food, so it's something that comes up when people are um, kind of really obsessed, regardless of anything else, when they're organizing their lives around food to an unhealthy way. Sometimes you can think about there being a larger spleen issue. Um, obsesses about eating, ruminates about menus. We see this in a lot of people who are fit according to um, Western standards. Um, obviously enjoys the physician's sympathy, so somebody who is needing to be nurtured, like not able to generate that nutrition from within and kind of needing it from other people. And then an inquiry concerning, um, there was a series of treatments, so acupuncture herbs, and then an inquiry concerning other ways to nourish himself. So we'll talk more about this, but um, often earth archetypes, and therefore people who might be prone to this kind of worrying, don't have a, aren't in touch with how they feel nourished outside from food. So food becomes the only vehicle by which they can nourish themselves. So sometimes just taking a step back and thinking like, what fills me up? What nourishes me? What makes me feel good? How can I make room for more of that in my life can help to bring this system back into balance? I'm sorry the typing is so small. Um, the handout you have is from this book, another fantastic book called The Power of the Five Elements. It's written by a Chinese, a classical Chinese acupuncturist who used to be a medical doctor. Um, and so he, he really goes into great detail and I think there's quizzes in there that break down what archetype are you? So are you more an earth person, a liver, or um, a wood person, a fire person, metal person? So again, the mother provider that is earth in a healthy way would be the unconditional love of a healthy mother that a healthy mother gives, or the nourishing qualities of every person. Um, somebody who provides, or even just the existence of a safe, secure, and nourishing environment. So somebody who's had that throughout their life is more likely to have a stable earth element. Someone who freely gives loving touch, encouraging words, steadying hands. So again, that gives support to others without needing something back. So healthy earth would be not self-absorption, but rather empathy and caring. It would be not ruminating thoughts and pensiveness, but taking action, which we'll talk about. It's another way to kind of break out of the worrying cycle, to just stop with the worrying and make a choice in that moment, because that's the problem, is the difficulty making a choice. The neediness would become loyalty, fidelity, and dependability. And then that this person is able to be content and to be satisfied. So something that we see a lot in Earth types is that they just Nothing's ever good enough. They're never satisfied. They always need more, uh, which we can relate back to, for example, the sweet 
taste and sugar cravings and how when you're, if, if any of you suffer from a sugar addiction, which I do, if you're, if you're on the sugar wagon, you just can't get enough. It's not actually um, nourishing for you, and yet you want more of it. You're never satisfied. Whereas if you gave yourself something deeply nourishing, you, you would be satisfied. Yeah, I have two questions. Mm-hmm. First of all, um, is there a connection when you talk about the five elements, is there a connection to some of the systems of astrology which identify the year and you were born according to the elements? I'm sure there is. I don't know anything about it. Okay, secondly, what this looks like to me is a lot of root chakra issues, and so I'm wondering if it also makes those connections. I think there's, I think that there's connections to be, there's so many systems that that are looking at these sorts of things. So I would say yes to all of that. And then the usefulness becomes, for me as a practitioner, how I organize this sense that I'm making of someone with tools to help them. So that's where the usefulness comes in. So if you're, so if you're talking chakras, then it's somebody who's working maybe from an Ayurvedic perspective and treating that way. I know chakras in the context of yoga, but haven't studied them professionally. So for me, speaking that way doesn't give me as many tools to help someone, but they're they can integrate very well, people who do both. And I know there's people who do both Vedic astrology and Chinese astrology and integrate a lot of that with this. I could give you some contacts if you're interested. I think it's fascinating. I just don't know anything about it. <clears throat> uh, we've kind of, it's so funny when you make PowerPoint and then go back over it, like I'm beating a dead horse here. We've gone over this already. But you know, repetition, right? Um, so a maladapted Earth. We've talked about the neediness. We've talked about um, a little bit about the anxiety, but sort of like stomach issues, the worry, the rumination, the feeling misunderstood, um, needing attention, unhealthy eating behaviors, maybe weight issues. So we've, we've talked about all of these things. Um, I thought there was an adapted Earth one. Oh, we skipped this one. So. This person, yeah, it's the opposite. They can understand other people's needs. They can experience contentment and fulfillment. They're able to be thoughtful and reflective and open to new ideas. For some people, the, the idea, having a new idea come in that they have to process is just, I can't do it. So if you're able to actually process information, theoretically, you're more open to new information because you can take in what you need and let go what you don't. There's a stability in an adapted earth person and a security getting their own essentials met. So people who are well adapted aren't afraid to say no. They're not afraid of taking care of themselves first and knowing that that's gonna actually let them serve others better. Things we know about worry itself, um, and this again, this is, a lot of this is excerpted from the book that I think is really helpful, but this particular physician's take on worry in Chinese medicine, so rooted in early experiences of feeling inadequate, unsupported, so not having that deep sense of nourishment and safety as a kid. Um, It's difficult to step out of ourselves when we're worried because you get stuck in that cycle of neediness, so it's hard to be compassionate or of service because you're sort of needing everybody else to be in your own service. Um, And he had some really interesting studies that, again, I can get people if they're interested, but that chronic worriers spend up to half of their time worrying. <laughs> so then if you go back to the beginning and think about how, what that generates then, so you're worrying, 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 and then that's impacting your digestion, which is impacting your whole energetic, um, which is impacting your channels, which then feed back in more to make your organs not happy. So it's just this cycle. And our, our job, my job is always to find, it's sometimes just this big mess of stuff, and my job is to just find the, what is the one way in? What's the one thing that we can do? And that's different for every person, even coming in with the same set of symptoms. What's the one thing that we can do to just start to tease this open? So mindfulness is a um, great antidote to the chatter of the mind, the monkey mind. It's a term, obviously, that we throw around all the time. And I think lots of people take it on and do a lot of it. And it's also really easy to dismiss because it's, it's become sort of trendy to be mindful. They're selling mindfulness all over the place, right? Um, But this idea that sitting quietly lets you observe your thoughts and recognize them as only thoughts. When we're out in our day doing things, we can actually feel like our thoughts are real that have to be tended to. And when your only job is to sit quiet, you can almost sit and laugh at 
how what your mind is doing. Does there does anyone do y'all have experience with mindfulness practices? Anybody not have experiences? There's no shame in that. <laughs> Everyone's done it, so you're all familiar. And then maybe y'all have heard this. I I've loved it since the first time I heard it. You should sit in meditation for 20 minutes every day, unless you're too busy, and then you should sit for an hour, <laughs> which I think is great. Um, and what I try to work with a lot with my patients, uh, in general, anything that's mindfulness-based is, in my opinion, if I keep hitting the microphone, is um, one part about the actual 20 minutes you're spending sitting, but more importantly, it's about stepping out into the world and what that means when you're at the grocery store and your mind is racing or you're picking your kid up from school and your mind is racing and what tools do you have to stop it in the moment. It's not really about the 20 minutes on the mat. It's about generating tools there that you take into your whole day. So helping people figure out um, what, how they can turn their triggers around, how they can catch themselves in habitual worrying or habitual thought patterns and try to reroute those pathways in their brain. Breathing being one of the best ways to do it for sure. Turning worry into action. So we talked, we mentioned this a little bit. It's this ruminating, spinning, 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 spinning. Um, recognize that all of that worrying, it's an opportunity uh, to generate something new. There's a lot of creativity in that. Again, you're taking in all this information and you get to birth something new out of it. So think about if you're suffering with a lot of worry, what about reframing that and thinking of it as a springboard? Thinking of that worry as a gift, maybe not calling it worry, but like you're, you know, you're digesting things um, and then using it as a, as a springboard to make some decisions. This fellow, Dr. Moss, recommends to stay focused on a single issue and then as a practice to not let yourself move on to the next issue until some sort of resolution has been made with the first. Because we tend to jump, like there's this problem and that one, and they just keep going, you're not allowed to move on to solving the next problem until you've done something little with the first one. So the, and then the first step, people get so stuck when you're ruminating on where do I even start? So the first step is just to make that first plan to, to change something, to make a decision. We all know this, concentrate on being in the moment, not what, hap not what might happen in the future, easier said than done. But finding those triggers in our day, well triggers where we're actually getting triggered, but also just do you have routines of things that you always do throughout your day? Maybe it's brushing your teeth or you know, when you leave your house first thing in the morning that can become a moment to take a deep breath, have a little moment of gratitude um, to get grounded and focus on being in the moment can set a time limit for thinking about every problem. So what if you just let yourself worry? What if you just set aside 30 minutes and called it your worry time? <laughs> so that you could just put some boundaries around it and then move on with the rest of your day and know that if something comes up, like it's okay, I'll get there tomorrow. You can put it on a worry list and tuck it somewhere away. But so it doesn't have to be this thing that's going all the time. And worry-free zone, notes around the house. No worrying. I know there's, um, I don't know whether this resonates with any of y'all's worldviews, but I know some people who have like a God box, and so when they have things that come up that just feel outside of their control, they write it down and put it in the God box, like it's not mine to worry about. So that works if that's your worldview for some people. Similar idea. It's for my worry time. Oh, we're not there yet. So those are some, some basic worry stuff. And then you've got uh, handouts. So, well, any questions? So far, I wanted to have a balance of like explaining the Chinese medicine piece, but also giving you some tools that maybe are tools you've heard before. It's not rocket science, but it's always helpful to hear again. Any questions about the Chinese medicine piece? Any uh, new connections made? Some of this new and interesting, old news? Heard it all before? <laughs> I would like to know what connects to your knee. Um, it depends a little bit. So the knee and the low back are governed by the kidney energetic. <laughs> um, but I always caution, it's really easy to jump to conclusions with this stuff. So it's all, it's all about the context. So that is specifically when there's like a weakness to them, not necessarily if there's um, like a back spasm or something more acute. It's sort of a sense of, yeah, just chronically my low, my low back and my knees are weak. And you can see that like as we get as we age, those things tend to get weak in us and the kidney energetic governs 
um, birth, growth, maturation, and, and a happy, healthy aging process. So, yeah. But then there's other, there's other ways to answer that question. Some people would talk about there's different channels that run through your knees. So the stomach channel, the, I mean, they all do. Stomach, well, half of them. So stomach, spleen, um, gallbladder, urinary bladder, kidney, liver, all of those run through your knee. So depending on where the pain is and the whole other constellation of symptoms, there might be a different answer to your question. Um, there are also... said definitely resonates. Okay. And there's also ways that, um, again, this isn't my area of expertise, but people will talk about particular muscles mm -hmm. representing particular emotions or ways that you might be stuck in life. So then those can be relevant. It's all about the context. Uh, okay, so if we look at our 10 keys for adaptation for the earth type, the double page, <clears throat> this is working on the assumption that if you're worrying in general that maybe some of these other earth issues are out of balance and by correcting any part of it you can bring the rest of it back together. We talked about number one, replace worry with reflection and action and some ideas there for what you might do. Number two would be to practice empathy and compassion. So if this doesn't come easily or um, yeah, to listen attentively and to seek uh, comfort when it's appropriate for you but to somehow leave the neediness out of it if possible. Um, find situations other than family and friends to help others in need, we'll talk about that. And to practice it if it's not something that comes easily. So for the earth person, some of these people are overly helpful and some of them could really use to be more helpful and that would help them get uh, more balanced. Seeking out satisfaction and contentment. So I mentioned this, that earth types often don't know what brings them contentment and they're seeking uh, pathologically that contentment to come from food or from aggressively helping others or from like the character who, who really liked the physician's attention. Um, there's people who will you know, jump around and around and around to different practitioners sort of needing their empathy. Um, so figuring out what are other things that maybe are healthier choices that can bring me satisfaction and how can I bring more of that into my life. Altruism and service being number four. So how can you, this is the empathy and compassion that's reaching beyond just personal relationships. Um, this again comes from research that the beneficial effects appear to depend on, and this is no surprise, just being actively involved. So writing a check to a charity is not the same as going and volunteering <laughs> and connecting and being of service in that way. Practicing gratitude, so this sense that uh, the feeling that Earth people might have that they never have enough, that everything is empty, again, because you're not getting nourished, and if you're not getting nourished in food or in life, you're, it's never going to feel like enough. So to cultivate a practice of gratitude, a lot of people talk about this, the attitude of gratitude is very hip lately, <laughs> um, but taking a walk, and just on the walk, practicing gratitude, and it can be, if y'all haven't tried this, it can be very simple, you know, just thankful for the sneakers that I have that are taking me on the walk, thankful that I could put on my pants this morning, thankful that, you know, I have a roof over my head that I'm walking out of if it's a rainy morning. I mean, it can be the most basic stuff. It's actually another really fun exercise to, um, I've, which I've done in the past, to have 30, 10 to 30 minutes every morning where you just write all the things you're grateful for in a book. So you start being grateful for like the tiniest things, like your duvet cover, <laughs> you know, um, and really being grateful for those things. Uh, practicing good self-care, so recognizing that taking care of yourself needs to come first if you're going to be able to take care of others well. This feeds back into understanding what brings you nourishment, and then doing those things and making time for those things fits into self-care common poor self-care habits for this particular person is going to be poor eating habits, not moving their body. Remember how um, muscles were associated with the earth element? So a lack of exercise, overextending or too many commitments, not being able to say no. So again, the earth mother that wants to do everything for everybody. It's one thing if you have the capacity to do that. But there's lots of people doing that who don't actually have the capacity. But they don't have the capacity to say no either. Yeah, learning how to stop being the person that everyone turns to for help and support, if this tends to be you, and carving out time for yourself. 
So think about affiliating and join. Again, just if these resonate with you, and if you feel like you are, th this earth type resonates with you, that uh, earth people like to be the center of a village. So if you're struggling, what if you can commit to being part of a group? Are you too isolated? And is there something in being part of a group that could help bring all of this back into balance for you? Number eight, good nutrition and eating habits, because we know how closely connected this is to your digestion. So as we've mentioned, earth types are more likely to use food to achieve satisfaction. So how do we find nourishment other than food? Um, nourishment, satisfaction, comfort, security, how do we have other sources for those? And then I say down there, um, ideas around eating. This is a handout that I give to a lot of my patients that runs through, from a Chinese medicine perspective, what good eating habits look like. I usually talk through, I'm not gonna go through it all, um, I usually talk through it in the context of what a healthy metabolism looks like because I think a lot of us are really, we've been told our whole lives what to eat, how to eat, what's healthy, what's not healthy, it's changing all the time. We've really become detached from how our body actually feels. So a lot of this is just, again, eating mindfully, taking the time to um, pay attention to what you're eating. We have strong feelings about eating just three meals a day and not snacking that having some space in between meals allows your body to build up that digestive fire. It allows your body some time to not be digesting. Your body, you know, di we're always digesting these thoughts. If we're digesting our food too, it's hard to do both. Other tips in here that I could, I could talk about more if you're interested. Um, I hand this out a lot and I talk with people a lot about this particular handout in my practice. So there's a lot of good info there. Um, taking care of your digestive system. So uh, digestion is highly coordinated. It involves a lot of different activities of hormones and enzymes and peristalsis. And we dampen it down quite a bit by commonly taking over-the-counter medication and prescriptions, often for gastric issues that are that don't necessarily require them. So to really think a little bit more deeply before taking those kinds of things and encouraging your loved ones to do the same, um, that, you know, so for example, I've got lots of people that will come in on acid blockers for acid reflux, and they've been on them for years, and we know that that significantly impacts your body's ability to absorb nutrients. Their doctors haven't told them that, so, but it, they don't want to suffer with the reflux, so let's get to the root of it, right? Um, so not to say that these medications are bad, but we, we use them a lot when there are a lot of other alternatives that we might want to try first to protect our digestive system, keep it intact. Of course, antibiotics kill everything in our guts. Most of us are familiar with that now. They're not just killing the bad bugs. We can be so happy that we have them, but they kill everything, and we really need to have the good bugs in there as well. Oh, and that's a whole other talk, which is coming out in the news that we could go off on at some point, um, just th that Western medicine is now making this connection, right, between the bugs in our gut and our mood. And people in my field are like, great, we've known that for a while now. <laughs> so it's becoming more specific. The, the, the mechanism by which that's the case is becoming more specific from a Western science perspective. But Eastern science has known this out of the gate. And it's no less true for talking about it in more general terms, as long as we have the tools to treat it and help people get better. Um, so yeah, use these pharmaceuticals sparingly and ask people about alternatives. And then we can be so grateful that we have these really, you know, in strong medications when they're truly needed. But often there are so many other things we can do before we bring them in. And then number 10, commitment and security. Big for the earth element. So um, if there's not security in your life in terms of home or finances or whatever might make one feel secure, is there a commitment to something larger that can bring some sense of existential security in some way? Um, that can help this particular element sometimes feel a little more balanced and therefore help all of the, re the rest of the picture. And now I think if I were to click the slide, it would say thank you. <laughs>